Thank you. So the last time I was here was at 2015. It was my, I guess it would have been, uh, I was 16, so it would have been my 30 year uh, reunion. And this campus, I gotta say, wow. You guys, you had no idea what it was like. It was like an institution before. It was a, it was a great campus, great, co great college, but it's nothing like it is today. Today it looks like a, to me, like a business park. You know, you walk in, there's trees, and the buildings are amazing, and you guys have a great environment for learning. I mean, the technology that I see throughout the campus is, is crazy. But I thought I would share with you first a little bit about myself so you know where I'm from and a little bit about uh, my, what my life's about. So, you know, I talk about the fact that I live in Rochester, New York. Does anybody know where Rochester is, curiously? I mean, it's really western New York. It's between Buffalo and Syracuse, New York. And, and honestly, uh, it's not too far from where I grew up. I grew up in Corning, New York, which is uh, a little bit further south than Rochester. And it's uh, really on the border of Pennsylvania. So if you can imagine New York as a triangle, imagine the border of Pennsylvania and the western part of New York. And, and that's where it was. It was a very small town, but it was also a company headquarters. And that's why we lived there. My father worked for a company called Corning Incorporated. And that's actually where I ended up uh, having 20 years of my 35 year career working for companies anyway. Uh, my degree, as it says here, was uh, computer information systems. I noticed that the, the title of the degree hasn't changed. How many people are CIS majors here? I had one before and we still just have one. And you know what? That's really cool. Uh, and I'll talk about the why in a minute. Uh, because what I think you'll find uh, in anybody's career and in my career is that this path you take from your degree it may take you on a, on a side path you didn't anticipate. And it's about risk taking. So the title of my pitch talks about risk taking and broadening experiences. And if I were to define my career, I would tell you that it really was all about those things. Some that were kind of informed that I knew what I was doing and some I realized and in, in looking back reflecting that that's what it was really about. Um, I got some hobbies, um, lots of very varied hobbies. You know, you guys might ask me about racing in a minute. I, everybody likes to talk about, oh, what do you talk about vintage racing? What is that? I'll, I'll share with you a little bit about that. Uh, but uh, I wanted to share with you my Myers Briggs uh, designation. Do you guys know what Myers Briggs is? It's kind of a self-assessment of what kind of person you are. Do you get, anybody know what these re represent? These different uh, letters. So there's I and E. Either you're introverted or extroverted. I'm more introverted, surprisingly enough. People who see me professionally would say, oh, you know, you're, you're not introverted. You're very extroverted. You're out here speaking in front of an audience and you're, you're fine. But if I'm in a social situation, I'm usually talking to a couple people. I don't, you know, engage with a lot of people. I tend to hang with the people I know. Uh, N stands for intuitive. Uh, you can be either sensing or intuitive. Uh, I'm more intuitive, so sensors are ones that really reflect and think about data and use data to make decisions. Intuitive look at bigger picture things. You know, they kind of say, I kind of see a, this kind of this mosaic of things and, and I, I kind of in, intuitively believe this is where we ought to go. And so I'm kind of a thinker that way. I kind of look at big things and then I look at details. And uh, thinking stands for just what it says. It's thinking. And, and so thinkers tend to like to think a lot about things before they answer. They don't just immediately blurt out what they think they like to really review and, and assess. Uh, and I'm a judger. I like to judge people. Uh, and so what that means essentially is that I'm really quick to a view on something. I might not say it, I'll think about it, but I, I'm, I'm pretty directive about what's good and bad. Um, and that plays into who you're gonna be as a leader. Trust me, every one of us, there are I think like 16 different, um, uh, if you take the four by four, it's 16, it's gonna be, 16 different types of this, if you use this assessment, will come up with. And so, uh, and it does, it does help you, but it also can be an hin a hindrance. And I was, I wrote these down, so if you pause, I'm just gonna read through. So strengths, I enjoy theoretical and abstract concepts. And I always have. Uh, I have high expectations, so uh, I don't believe there's such a thing as good enough. I have to have perfection in my life, which is a really good thing sometimes. Sometimes it can really take away from being great at something because you obsess about the things you didn't do well. Uh, I'm consen considered to be a fairly good listener because again, I'm thinking, so I'm, I, like to, I like to hear what people have to say. It says I take criticism well, I'm not so sure that's true. <laughs> but according to this designation thing, it says, and it says I'm self-confident and hardworking. That's all good strengths, okay? Weaknesses though, overly analytical, judgmental, not good. Perfectionist, I talked about that one. I, I dislike talking about how I feel about things. Yes, there's, you know, uh, thinking and feeling, the T and an F. F is feel, how do I feel about something? I tend to look at data to make my decisions, but anyway. 
Um, and I can be insensitive sometimes. I'm not really aware of what, because I'm, I'm, I'm not really, perhaps the word shouldn't be caring, but I'm, I'm more concerned about outcomes than I'm concerned about the way someone feels about an outcome. Uh, as a leader, believe me, uh, and the way I deal with people, that has come to play. So anyway, that's who I am. And uh, I have some involvement in other things. Uh, let's see, let me get this to go. Am I going the wrong direction? No, come on, there we go. Uh, so, Bentley. So that was me. I had hair, believe it or not. I'm the guy in the middle. And uh, that's my roommate, who I had the same roommate uh, from the Elm dorm, you know, the tree dorms, all the way through my senior year. And that was just a very good friend who was a major in the same major I was, named Jackie Chan, and she still lives in the area. In fact, they both live in the area. But what about Bentley? So I'm going to tell you what you're going to get from Bentley that maybe you don't fully understand or appreciate at this point in time. Uh, but the first thing is, you're getting a broad business education. I don't care whether you're uh, a major in finance or you're a major in operations analysis or you're going to do AI, whatever it might be as a major, you're going to get a pretty broad set of skills coming here through your four years. And it, trust me, the things you think are important to you right now, that you think in your career are going to be the things that really matter, it's not going to be those things. It's going to be the foundation of, the, of, of the, all these things in conjunction that really really come to play and did for me activities, whether you're in the hockey team or you're involved in this computer information society as we used to call it back in the day, or you're involved in a fraternity, whatever it might be, they have many of them here. And trust me, again, those things will help develop you as a leader. Those things, like if you get to be on a, uh, one of these clubs and you get to be the president of the club and you're the one having to deal with the budget as the, as the treasurer, these are things that actually, believe it or not, um, help. Probably the most important thing uh, is, uh, I would say, the next two, career pr preparation and connections to potential employers, and they're interrelated. So the professors like Mark here, they, they have connections to various companies, and they work with these companies to bring students in to, to work with different things that they're, they're doing as a company. And companies are investing in fairly innovative things. And it's probably the only place you're going to get to really, outside of a lab, to see it in real practice, really being done by a company. And companies don't spend money in things they don't think bring profit. So it's being done because there's a reason that they feel there's value or there's an intended opportunity for value. And that leads to employers. So the on-campus recruiting here is second to none. It was back in the 80s, and it still is today. The connections to the companies that you can, you can get to do on-campus interviews with and to engage with is I think, and I have two sons who went to different colleges, and I can tell you that Bentley, far superior. And, and that's gonna matter to you in two years when you get to the point where you start thinking about you know, where you're gonna land. Uh, and the alumni network. Um, I would say that I've signed up, uh, I was telling Mark earlier, I've signed up to, to help and coach students who are looking to get into the industry, uh, in my industry, with the IT or in manufacturing. Very few actually call. Uh, or you know, these days, internet link, whatever you want to call it, uh, text. Uh, and I don't know why, you know, because if you look at the, the alumni that are uh, at Bentley, because it, this is a business college, they tend to have a lot of business connections with their entrepreneurial um, experiences or are looking for large companies like I did. Um, those are important. So uh, that's, I think, uh, something you should take advantage of, and, and I hope you do. Many don't. Uh, and it's a fun experience. I had a great time at college. If that doesn't show you, um, yeah, I had a great time. Uh, let's see if I can get this thing to go. All right. So I started my professional career at GE. So I had an internship with Fidelity Investments, um, and I learned some technology that they had there. And so when I was looking to uh, interview, one of the things I put down were the, were the experience I had at, at, at Fidelity, which was on a certain technology. Mind you, I was in information technology, and so they were looking for me to have some baseline technology experience, and GE was looking for this particular skill set. But it wasn't the only reason. They interviewed, and they, and they had taken many uh, other uh, Bentley grads. And at the time, GE, I was very lucky. Do you guys know who Jack Welch is? I mean, I don't know if anybody here knows. So Jack Welch was the CEO of the company, and when he took over the company, it went through a very big transformation. It was a fairly, still a fairly large company from a Fortune 500 perspective, but it um, basically tripled in size during that time period that he was leading the company. He took over in 81, I joined in 85, so there was a lot of acquisitions going on, they were doing a lot of hiring, and uh, 
the key thing that Jack Welch did is he focused on, on leadership training. He created a whole university inside of the company to do that, a place called Crotonville. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, he's since gone and uh, they've gone to other things now. But at the time, uh, it was considered to be the top place to go and get some, some training. So I chose GE because I knew that I wasn't done learning. I chose GE because I knew I wanted to get some development experiences. So my advice to you is when you're looking for companies, find companies who are investing in training. They were investing a lot in training. Um, and then the second thing that happened, and I want to start weaving in this idea of risk. So I started out as an IT person working in an IT organization in a division of, of GE that was $7 billion company itself. It's, it was big on its own rights, but still uh, it was an IT job. And the belief at the time was that everybody's just going to go through their kind of trajectory of going to be an IT programmer, and then you're going to be a programmer analyst, and you'll be an analyst. And well, then you'd be a project manager, maybe, and then maybe you'll be a program leader, and well, then maybe someday you'll be a manager. And it was going to take 20 years to get to a point where you know you might be an IT leader, like a CIO. And um, I was told very directly that if you don't follow that path, if you vary from that path, well, good luck. You'll never get back into IT. Now, mind you, I told you I ended my career as a CIO at Corning. I left the GE IT kind of brethren of experiences. And I joined something called the audit staff, which is an internal consulting group that did many things. They did financial audits, certainly, because they're an audit staff. But they also did reviews looking at inventory levels of uh, aircraft engines division. Or we did acquisitions and acquisition, acquisition analysis. We did um, operational reviews of manufacturing. So I had this really like an MBA-like experience. But instead of going to college or university and reading a case study, we were actually doing this work. And we were being paired with as young professionals, with people who are experts in the field in these assignments. So like think of doing, you know, if you, if you like what I like most about GE uh, coming to Bentley was the team experiences where you do these team projects. So we were doing these basically 100% of the time and I got to travel and see pretty much the entire uh, part of Corning, which, you know, Corning, I'm saying Corning, GE. So uh, aircraft engines, medical systems, plastics, Power generation, lighting, appliances, financial services, credit card, leasing. I got to see all these businesses in a very short period of time, over four years. The second thing that I think was really important about this experience is that um, you made connections with uh, various people in the company who were looking for people uh, to take over different uh, aspects of, of work. And so one of the guys I met was with GE Plastics, and he was starting a new division in GE in Singapore and the Pacific. And so the idea was we were going to take our business and, and start to expand it in Asia. And so I was, uh, I think, 20, 28 years old, 27 years old, and uh, I had an opportunity to become the IT leader for a emerging, very small, eventually a $2 billion part of the business uh, as an IT leader because of the audit staff experience. So took this risk, went out, went back. When I went back, some of the people who said, you'll never come back into IT reported to me. So it was really weird, but you can you know, take a risk and those broadening experiences can really play, play dividends. Then I spent time in a division called Super Braces, industrial diamonds business. We actually made diamonds, what Mother Nature does, we used to do in a manufacturing setting. And, and then I went to GE Medical Systems in Milwaukee. So I should also point out, I mean, I lived in, uh, you know, Pittsfield, Massachusetts for the first job. The second job I lived in, in uh, two places, actually three, Fairfield, Connecticut, uh, in uh, Schenectady, New York, and in Granby, Massachusetts. Then I was in Singapore. Super Braces was in Columbus, Ohio. And then Medical Systems was uh, in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, and that was over 15 years. I, I moved around that much. And those are, that's a decision trade-off when you're looking at your career. How much are you willing to move? Do you like to stay local to home or not? That, that could be important to, to know. Uh, the second uh, company I worked for, and I only really worked for two, come on, Connect, there you go, uh, was Corning Incorporated. And so some of you heard me say earlier, if you have a, an iPhone, you have Corning glass on your iPhone. It's the glass, the cover glass, and the backing glass on the iPhone. It is also an LCD TV. If you got an LCD TV, the glass on that, the big panel TVs, uh, that's Corning glass. If you use the internet, you're using our fiber optic networks. Um, it's fiber optics was invented by Corning. 
Corning is a basically an innovation company. They, they, they use inorganic science to make various uh, materials. If you have a COVID vaccine, I hope you did, uh, the vials that the COVID vaccine goes in are glass called um, Valor glass. And so glass is a big part of it. Your catalytic converters that are in your cars, 50% um, of that business is owned by, by Corning. Basically, it's the substrate that's in, the, in that stuff or diesel filter. So um, pretty, pretty innovative company. And, and in Corning, uh, the experience was, was more, probably more traditional. But um, a couple of things I would highlight that were our risks that I took when I came to Corning. Corning when I arrived was doing amazingly well. The telecommunications market was growing, everything was great, and all of a sudden the company stock went from 127 a share down to $1.16 a share because the telecom market had the bottom fall out. They had overbuilt up the market. There was not enough uh, pull from the, from the market to, to accept the, the uh, size of the, of, the, of the expansion the market had made, and Corning had invested pretty much everything into it. The company almost got delisted, which means the company almost didn't exist. It would have been sold off for its parts. And uh, I was only a year and a half into that thing. I moved my family to Corning, New York, and I'm like, holy crap, what am I going to do? I started calling all my friends up in GE saying, hey, look, you know, I was only just kidding about leaving, and I really want to come back. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, a guy that uh, I worked with had taken notice to some of the things I was doing. He said, would you be willing to stay? Uh, he goes, I got this job. Uh, we're looking to try because the company was just just falling apart. He goes, I need to consolidate all these information systems into a one system because we can't afford all these different systems anymore. Uh, so we're going to centralize a lot of what was decentralized. Would you be willing to take that job? And I said, you know, I, I don't know if I want to stay at Corning. I, I got to think about my family. I, I, I'm worried about the company surviving. But he, he told me that, you know, he, he felt the company was going to be successful in its recovery, and, and it was. But you know, I had a choice to, I had other job offers by then. I was ready to move. And he said, no, do this job. And it would turn out to be the best thing I ever did. Because I had, again, exposure to some things in the company that I had never seen before. I got exposure to people who were there trying to, to fix the company. And to be part of that fix, to be part of the team that was you know, really viewed as, as part of the recovery of the, the company was great. It gave me uh, access to some people who I describe as mentors now. And so these people say, hey, look, this guy, hard-working guy, he's, uh, he's, he's willing to, to put the effort in, and, and so they gave me opportunities into these other jobs. So the first job, um, that division actually got, got sold to another company during the downturn, and then I ran what they call administrative systems, so all the financial systems, the HR systems, the supply chain systems, all, all the back, you know, back office systems uh, we consolidated. And then I ran service delivery after that. And service delivery is think about you know, everything from help desk to the operations infrastructure of the company. We, we had a build back model. So it was almost like running a company. That was really a cool experience. I actually got to have a profit, if you will, a profit model. I, I made revenues and I had costs and I had to make you know, profit, if you will, that went back to the company for reinvestment. But anyway, that was that. Then I ran all the IT division IT department leaders reported to me. So I basically all the business unit IT folks. Um, so business unit IT, what they do is they kind of get the requirements from the company. They, they work with the business to say, hey, what are you trying to get uh, uh, done from a, from a profitability standpoint? How do we use technology to, to invest and, and create those opportunities uh, and, and use technology to, to serve the business? So that was that job. And I did that for a while. And I spent some time in China because Corning was expanding quite a bit in China at the time. And uh, then that brought me into this role where I was basically the chief of staff for the CIO. And basically that job is looking at strategy and, and, and so forth uh, for the company. And then the bottom line is uh, I got this opportunity to be a CIO. And I want to talk a little bit more about that because uh, I want to talk about the, the concept of uh, interviewing. So there are two ways, in my view, for you to be interviewed when you're interviewing. One, one way to be interviewed is to let that, that interview ask you a lot of questions about your background, what you have in your resume. Another one is to say, look, I'm gonna look at this company and see what I think they need. And instead of letting that person kind of dictate the conversation, I'm gonna dictate where I think we should go. And what I did is I, I took the opportunity to say, look, I'd like to share a strategy with you. I've been in the company for 15 years at that point in time. I said, I think I know pretty well how IT works and where the business challenges are. Let me instead of you interview me today, let me take some time and I'll walk you through this, this, this strategy and vision I have for IT. 
it got me the job. So they, um, they had external candidates and internal candidates, so there were six people that were vying for the CIO job, and I really think me taking that risk of you know, saying, look, I'm just gonna put myself out there. If I don't get the job, what's the worst thing that can happen? I keep the job I have or I leave, right? Uh, so that was a big, big deal uh, in, in my ability to get that job was that interview process. I interviewed 19 times. So every time we would we'd get close to a decision, they said, well, we want to interview this other external candidate. And the only way to do that fairly is we have to have the internal candidate who's still, who's still in the game, I was the one who was left, to interview as well. So I had a chance to interview three times, and every time I said, no, we're going to talk about the strategy. We're not going to talk about me. You know me. I've been here 15 years. So, so what am I doing now? Uh, I started an a, uh, advisory firm looking at digital transformations for companies, which basically means I help them with their IT strategies. Believe it or not, although the large companies have largely gone through digital transformation, they have very well-defined strategies, many mid-sized and small companies have not done that yet. So most of the companies I work with, Roush Engineering, uh, Wellover Construction, these are small companies, uh, uh, they, they're trying to do what the large companies have done and, and having that experience, being a, you know, able to provide an, an advisory role to the CIOs of those companies. Um, I'm able to give them some context and some experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to afford. Uh, and um, I run, uh, uh, I've been very involved in, in, in outside um, community services. Uh, United Way, I was on the board, I was the board chair for a while, but um, this one was pretty important during COVID. We were, we were trying to figure out how to make sure that um, we could take monies that were being gifted by large companies like Corning and where it should go to help uh, people through COVID. One of the areas we invested in was actually uh, providing internet to r rural areas because the kids couldn't go to school and you guys were probably some of you right in the middle of all this. You know, we had to bring the school to the kids and so in rural upstate New York, there aren't a lot of internet, um, you know, services out there that are really robust enough to do virtual classrooms. So we spent a lot of money on that. Um, and I'm gonna go back to my racing experience. So I grew up, uh, near a place called Watkins Glen. Any of you NASCAR fans or anything like that? Because that's what people know it as, but it's a racetrack. And uh, I had a, a friend of mine whose father was very involved in racing and, and took me to the race. And if you ever been in, like maybe when you guys started playing hockey, you just kind of felt like this is, this is what it is for me. And I, I remember I could, if you could have made a cologne that smelled like a racetrack, that, that would have been what I wore because I really got excited about racing. And so I told myself that I was going to do that. I can tell you right now that it's a very expensive sport to be involved in, and uh, it's not one where you can just buy a glove and you're, you're playing. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's some real uh, time of investment to get licensed and do all this. And I, I did it uh, a little bit when I was working before I came to Corning, but when I got to Corning, I, I got more involved. And so in retirement, I was able to really fully invest my time in it, and I got to uh, a point where I was able to, to win a championship, and that was really cool. Um, Samadra is a uh, think tank. So another thing you can do in your life is get involved with these uh, research firms and what they do is they're looking at big problems and they say, hey look, let's, let's do some uh, research and they'll bring people who are advisors in to help with the research. And so with my background, uh, I do work with the Samadra group. They do um, a lot of think thinking around digital and where digital transformation is going and AI. And, and so uh, that gives me an opportunity to stay current with other thought leaders in that space. Uh, and then obviously I, I spent a lot more time with my family and I would uh, tell you in a minute that one of the trade-offs you're going to have to make in your career is how much work-life choice you want to make. And I use the word choice because you'll make decisions that will impact the amount of time you spend with your family or wh how much career advancement you might see. There's no such thing as a perfect balance. And in some cases you'll make a bad decision. And I did make a few in my lifetime as well. So. That's me in the car, that's, a, that's one of the cars that I have. But, uh, so I'm gonna share some humble advice with you. I hope you'll, you'll take them to heart. Um, so the first one is, if you don't have a goal about where you think you're gonna be in, in 10 years or 20 years, you should start thinking about that. Just, it doesn't have to be right, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be what you have passion around now. Uh, for me, at the time, I always wanted to be a CIO. I'm just gonna say it right up front. I, I had this big dream. I had a grandfather who was a, an executive. And I thought what he did look really cool. You know, he was wearing his business suits. And I thought, well, man, I, I could do this job. And so I, I had that. And, you know, there were times when I changed 
thinking about that, I said, you know, I don't, I don't want that job. And that's when I went to the audit staff. I said, that IT role doesn't seem like it's the right place for me. But uh, I came back because I, I really do feel that IT creating value for a company is a big deal and, and something I'm pretty good at, at providing. Um, and this is the one that some of you who uh, are in the introverted and, and maybe uh, ones who kind of hide in the corner a little bit, let me explain something to you that you don't probably fully understand. Is you're competing right here, right now, with everybody who's sitting around you. And whatever it is you're thinking, there's somebody else who wants the same thing you do and is willing to put the extra work into it, put the extra cycles in. And so if you're not thinking about competing, and when I was a freshman in college, I wasn't, I wasn't worried about my grades. Not really. I wasn't thinking about the guy next to me might be interviewing at GE with me and, and I might be competing with that individual. But I was. You'll learn that later as you get a little bit further down your, your uh, time here at Bentley, but you are competing. If you don't have a certain grade point average, some, some of these employers won't even look at you. Uh, if you haven't done some of these extracurricular things, they won't, they won't look at you because they're looking for well-rounded people. They're looking at people they feel that are going to have drive. And you can be introverted and have drive, and you can be extroverted and have drive, but just fully commit to whatever it is. So have a vision and think about it and say, you know, damn it, I'm going to go compete. I'm going to look at the guy that were left and right of me, and I'm going to compete for that work. Be opportunistic. So I think sometimes uh, you get a very kind of let's call it too rigid view of your mind about what the way the things ought to be in your life and the way things ought to be for what you want to do. And some things will come in as curveballs at you. And those curveballs are the ones that might lead to something you didn't even think of that's even better than you, you were considering in your, your current thought. So when I went to the audit staff, that all occurred because I was asked as one of my assignments to help out an audit that was going on in my division. And I was talking to those guys and I'm like, holy crap, this stuff looks like a lot of fun. Let me try it. And then I was told by my own leadership, if you do that, you're not coming back. So uh, I was saying to myself, screw it. If, I, if, if it doesn't turn out, I don't care. I'll just go work for another company. I had confidence in myself that I could find another job. And I said, I'm just going to be uh, opportunistic. And I took a risk. Do that. Challenge yourself. When I went to Singapore, I had to look at it and say, where the hell is Singapore in a map? I had no idea where Singapore was in a map. And then I thought about it, what it would be like. It's going to be very, I said to myself, it's going to be very third world. You know, what is it going to be like there? Am I going to move my family there? I had a young son at the time. He was 18 months old. Am I going to move him there? Uh, you got to take risks. The risk about the interview. I said, you know what? I'm not going to do this. I, I was tired of the, the, the first interview. I did the traditional way and answered the question. I said, I've worked here 15 years. The guy I was interviewing knew me for 15 years. I and mean, he's asking me these stupid questions like he doesn't know me. And I said, you know, I'm going I'm to change that. I decided to take control of my destiny and I, and I went after it. Yeah, this is what I worry about um, with people. And this is why when I said that we have one person in this room, I believe, who's a CIS major. Uh, and I said that's a good thing. And now I'm going to tell you why. Because no matter what career you're going to take, um, anything you do in manufacturing, you need to know something about finance and marketing and, um, you know, whether it be uh, IT or AI or any of these things, um, you need to be, you have, that, have to have an expertise to get in the door. No doubt. You know, they're going to say, hey, do you know how to program in Python? Yeah, I know how to do that. Okay, I'll give you a job. But once you're in that job, the Python you're writing is going to be, you know, probably around some other business process that you're not a major in. So take these broadening experiences and, and make sure that, that you, you take advantage of anyone that's given to you. Like, you know, if you get a chance to so so can you work on this other project? I know it's not in your area of expertise. Do it. If you have an opportunity to, to come to these kinds of, of uh, presentations and you're not forced to because there's some credit involved, do it. Because you're going to learn something from that individual that uh, will probably lead to an opportunity you didn't plan on. And it certainly happened several times in my career. And um, the last one, is, we were talking about this at lunch uh, with the head of the IT department, our CIS department here. And, and this is uh, emotional intelligence. So what you're going to learn here uh, at Bentley is a lot around concepts and theories and technologies um, that are foundational to a business career, absolutely. But what they don't spend as much time on, they do, actually, I was talking to Mark, and I think you guys are doing this more than, than we did it, but when you're in these team experiences where you're kind of on a project together, 
Um, learning about who you are, first of all, how you operate, what makes you successful, and how you can influence others to do what you want them to do with you to get the job done, and dealing with internal politics, and, and recognizing the human element of your, of your work, that is a tough one, and it's really hard to teach it. It comes through experience and hard knocks, scars. But I want to tell you right now, take the time to cultivate and the best way you can cultivate is know your strengths and weaknesses. And I'll guarantee you, as I sit here in front of you, that you don't know all your strengths and weaknesses. Because it's hard for someone to know thyself, right? People sometimes have to give you feedback. We were talking at lunch, and I know that sometimes you have to do these peer reviews on your, these project teams. How many of you in a project team, who you have a friend, maybe it's the guy sitting next to you, or it's somebody you, you, uh, you have to work with next month on something else on another project, how many of you have said to that person, you know what, I hate to tell you, but you really suck at this. Or you're not here enough, you're not doing your job, you're not picking up your, you're not, I'm pulling up your slack because you're not doing your job, I have to do your job for you. I remember a, a particular project we were doing at Bentley when I was a student, and we had this guy, he always wanted to be a part of our team because he knew this was a good group of people and we all pulled our weight. And he thought he could just kind of slide in there and we'd just pull his weight. We let him in once, he took advantage of us, and after that, you know, we never let that guy in again. And so he didn't get the experience he could have had, in my view, working, working as this, on this team. So just know your skills and, 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 and know what you're strong at and what you're not good at. And um, because if, you, if someone tells you that, you know, guess what, you, know, you stink, uh, maybe you'll want to work on it. Maybe you'll say, you know, geez, I don't want to see people perceive me that way, that I'm not capable of doing this work well, or they see me as a slacker, or whatever. There's an emotional intelligence to doing that, to telling somebody that. Having the confidence to tell them that, and say, I, I still believe in you, but I really gotta tell you that if you don't fix this thing, and you don't work on that, that you know, you're not gonna be on this team again. You're not gonna make it. You're not gonna be part of this group. I'm gonna, and if you get to be a leader like you will at some point, you're gonna have to say, I'm sorry, but I have to let you go. That's the toughest thing to have to do. I've done layoffs of thousands of people. It's a terrible thing to do, where you walk them in a room and you say, I'm sorry, there's no job here today, because guess what? Leadership failed you. I've been in a situation where I had a person who stole money from the company. You're gone. I had a person who just was inappropriate in the way that they were dealing with their, with their peers, not in a, in a sexual cut way or anything like that, but just simply, you know, they were just not behaving uh, in the culture of the way the company needed to operate because we need a team, we need people to work together. So this emotional intelligence thing, it's a big, big deal. And it's probably the thing that when you walk out of this room, you ought to spend the most time thinking about. And all this other stuff, you'll get it from the, the education you get here. This is a great university. That one comes from the school of hard knocks. You've got to learn and you've got to ask people and take feedback. Be willing to say, hey, look, do I stink? Because I really want to know, because I, I am serious about fixing it if I'm not there. 